everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Heidi from My Reading Life and I'm here today to film my booktube prize ranking and review video. So this was for the quarterfinals uh, nonfiction round for the booktube prize and I'm just going to quickly go through these in the order from my least favorite to my most favorite. So my number six to my number one and give you a brief um, rundown of my thinking about the book and try to keep this very, very brief. <laughs> All right, so in sixth position in my group, I have this chunker, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days, The True Story of the American Woman at the Heart of the German Resistance to Hitler by Rebecca Donner. So this was um, a book that I had not heard of before the Booktube Prize started. And I was not, like, World War II is not an era that I love to read about, although I have read some really good books from that era. So, you know, I didn't know what to expect when I went into it. And it really is a very strange book, if you ask me. I found it to be really, it was extremely readable. Um, but the you can see that the chapters are very, very short. And in each chapter are sort of these sections within the chapter. And the chapters could be like maybe five pages long and then they're broken down into these little excerpts in the meantime. So it reads very, very quickly, but because of that style of writing, I found it to be quite choppy. The first half of this, I was like, I don't know what's going on. So we're following the story of this woman, um, Mildred Harnick who uh, at like in her middle 20s enrolls in a university and a PhD program in Germany. And this is in 19, the early 1930s, 1932, say. And um, this is during Hitler's rise to power in Germany. And she is there. She's very intellectual. You know, she's meeting all these people. They're having all these ideas and you know discussions they get together and they have these parties and they talk about you know their ideas about society late into the night and of course she and her compatriots are horrified at the rise of Hitler so she gets involved in the resistance to Hitler basically but we don't know an awful lot about this woman because she hid everything she was doing so much stuff basically spy work in that she didn't keep any records of anything and the stuff that we do have it was either coded or it was lies or whatever so you know it was really hard to this person Rebecca Donna who's putting the story together and she's putting the story together because um I believe she's yeah she's the great great niece of this woman Mildred Harnick and so it's sort of a family legend, family lore kind of situation. But we don't have very much primary documentation to help sort of buttress the story. Um, and so it's very um, scanty information that we have on this woman. So I, I thought that it was really hard to get us. I think one of the reasons why this story was choppy and it was hard to follow is because there's very little information that the author could really draw upon to tell the story. So the second half was a little bit better. It did come together a little bit more and was a little bit more engaging. Um, but I do still question how much of this story is really knowable, how much of this is really the truth. Um, it just feels like huge pieces are missing. There's a lot of names being dropped. I think if I had not read the book by um, Eric Larson about the same time period, I would have been completely lost. I wouldn't have known who any of these people were. But because I had read that book uh, in the Garden of Beasts or whatever that uh, Eric Larson book is, which is about the same time period, just not specifically about Mildred um, Mildred. Harnick. Uh, I think I would have just been completely lost. So I just, I just, for me, it just didn't work. The structure didn't work. And I just think that there wasn't enough information about this woman to really tell a story, especially not a story this long. So yeah, this one just did not work for me. But I will say I did rank this book um, three stars. So it wasn't like an awful book. I didn't hate it. I just, I just feel like it just wasn't a book for me. So yeah, that was the lowest ranked book in this group. So that I think shows you how strong the group was. 
So then the set in number five position um, for me was American Baby by Gabrielle Glazier. And this one I liked a little bit better. Um, I gave it 3.25 stars. Uh, and the subtitle for this one is A Mother, A Child, and The Secret History of Adoption. So this is um, both the telling of a story of a specific woman and the child she gave up for adoption and the story of the history of adoption in America. And I will tell you that it was very difficult to read this book because I was reading it at the same time that all the stuff was coming out about the Supreme Court um, and the, you know, the Roe v. Wade decision and all that kind of stuff. And so it was really, really difficult to read about the history of this topic at the same time that we are seeing history you know, of the last 50 years uh, about to be changed. So yeah, that part I think was was emotionally difficult in terms of reading this story. And, uh, you know, all of the stuff that was happening in context of abortion in mid 20th century in America, you know, abortion was illegal, women were forced to give birth to children and then to give them up for adoption if they were unmarried. Um, it's, you know, it's like history is going to be repeating itself. And so I, I just, it's a very difficult topic. I think the facts in this book around the history of adoption in 20th century America were excellent. I really, that part of the book I thought was really well done. But the story of this woman, Margaret, and the son that she gave up for adoption, David, was less, uh, it worked less well for me. I found it actually kind of boring at times. I mean, I felt badly for Mildred for what she was put through um, in terms of, you know, she as a, you know, a young woman, as an 18 year old, she gets pregnant from her high school boyfriend and their parents force them to give up the baby, even though they want to get married. But because at that time, um, if the male was not 21, then he needed his parents' permission to get married. Um, so they could not get married legally in their state. And they were at the mercy of their parents who, for their own reasons, decided that they weren't going to let these two get married. So they end up being forced to give up their baby for adoption. And then they do get married and have like three or four more kids. And so you're getting their story and you're also getting the baby story, you know, David's story. He was given up for adoption. He was adopted by a family who was very good to him. He had a good life. So, I mean, there was no... Yes, it was awful what happened to Mildred, uh, to Margaret, excuse me, but it wasn't, uh, there wasn't, there was no dramatic stuff that happens, you know, and so I just found like the, it was just too long. It just was too boring. It went into the minutia of each of their lives. Um, and it just, that part I just wished was, uh, a little bit less of that part. I will say this is also a very, um, white story and the author does address that in the, in terms of that, um, all of the documentation for what happened with these adoptions was kept secret. And it was also kept even more secret for black people. Like this is only, um, we only have history on this for white people and not for black people. And I wrote down this quote that I think kind of um, sums this part up. As in every examination of post-World War II history in America, race plays a role. The world of closed adoptions into which Margaret and David were thrust was overwhelmingly white. White middle-class parents were the primary customers of the adoption industry. The experiences of black women with unplanned pregnancies unfolded in an entirely separate realm, typical of our segregated nation. So yeah, that was another thing that was like, we're missing on an entire segment of the population here in this story, in this history, and that's problematic as well. So then in fourth position, um, I put A Ghost in the Throat by Doreen Negri Negrifa. Um, and I apologize if I just butchered that. And this one I gave 3.5 stars. And I listened to this one on audio and I definitely um, enjoyed the experience of listening to it on audio. Um, the, the narrator had an Irish accent. It was lovely. Um, and because I can't pronounce any of the stuff, um, that was written in Gaelic, then it was great to have that pronounced for me. So, um, the beginning of this book, I really enjoyed a lot. 
the author is very much like a person that I could relate to. She makes a lot of lists and it's really important to her to like check them all off. And she gets a lot of satisfaction from like keeping her life organized and working from these checklists. Um, I could totally relate to that. There was a lot in the beginning of the book about her um, being a mom and her experiences of motherhood and breastfeeding and what it's like to go through difficulties in those areas I thought was really, really excellent. Um, but then she gets obsessed with researching this historical personage, this woman who wrote this epic poem about her husband and her husband being murdered. And, and our author gets extremely, extremely obsessed with this. And she's trying to do all this research. And she's making the point that women's history has not been recorded in the same way that men's history has, which, yes, absolutely true. Um, but because of that, there's very little information on this woman poet. And so she can't, she has a hard time like finding any of the background, like what about her family? What about her children? And there just really isn't any documentation. And so she's just like forcing the story along. And I just really didn't care. <laughs> I really didn't care about any of that part of the story, other than that, the fact of the matter that she's making and underlining the point that the history of women has been underreported because men are in charge. And I get that. And I think that is an important point to be made. But I just think that it didn't work um, to go into such depth about this woman poet where there really isn't any documentation to tell the story. She was like making stuff up about this poet's kids, about her family, like stuff she couldn't have known because there's no documentation. She was just making it up. And like, I'm like, that's not nonfiction. I mean, yes, write a, write a novel about that if you want to, <laughs> but, well, you know, and, and the part about her experiences trying to do the research were good, but then like her extrapolation of what these people were like or what happened to them, that, that just didn't work. Um, yeah. So that was why that one went in number four. So then the next three are the ones that I, um, voted to move forward. And in third position was Fuzz by Mary Roach. And the subtitle for this one is When Nature Breaks the Law. Now I am a big Mary Roach fan. I've read many, many of her books in the past. I really love her writing style where she takes a topic like this and she like researches the heck out of it. And she's very humorous and she includes a lot of like really lighthearted, um, some would say um, sophomoric style humor in regards to it. I love how she um, writes these pieces about different attempts by humans to um, enforce the rule of law on nature and animals. And then she'll she'll be telling this story and she'll have these footnotes that go off onto some side topic or some funny thing that she's observed or experienced that relates to the topic. I love how she does that. I think she she's just a master at this type of nonfiction. And I really appreciate it. I think if it's the kind of thing that you like, you're really going to like this particular offering from Mary Roach. You know, there's stuff in here about how humans try to keep bears from breaking into humans' houses. And there's stuff about how we try to keep deer from running out into the road and so that we won't hit them with our cars. And what the, the end result comes down to most of the time is um, it's our own fault why we keep having these negative interactions with animals. It's like we've encroached into their habitat or we don't understand their um, nature or their uh, biology and why they're doing the things that we do. And we just keep trying to like force them to act in a way that doesn't work for their um, biology and lifestyle. And uh, so in general, the problem is us and not the animals. So I really, really enjoyed that book. I listen, Again, I listened to this on audio and I read it back at the end of 2021. So um, that is a book that I really, really enjoyed and um, I had already read before uh, this round started. So I gave that one four stars. And then in this number two position, I had The Groundbreaking, An American City and Its Search for Justice by Scott Ellsworth. I had this in my group for the last round of the Book Two Prize. Um, and uh, I can't remember if I had it in first place or second place. But again, it's just one that I really like. This book is about the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre in Oklahoma and the author is white, but he does a really excellent job, I think, of he he briefly tells the history of the actual event and then most of this book talks about um 
the repercussions of that in in Tulsa and brought more broadly in the United States, um, how the event was buried by the white community and the history was basically um, shoved underground and never discussed to the point where we didn't know even the number, total number of people who were killed during this event. Um, and the book details the efforts that had been made by the black community to like, to force everyone to reckon with this um, horrible, horrible atrocity that happened um, to discuss, you know, not not just me remembering what had happened and memorializing the, the lives that were lost, but also talking about reparations. And because people lost everything, they lost their businesses, their homes, their wealth, everything that they had been building in this area of Tulsa that was really an up and coming and very, um, economically and um, community-wise, very healthy um, place to live. Uh, so yeah, this book, truly an excellent piece of his history, um, narrative nonfiction. Can't recommend this one highly enough. Um, this one also got four stars for me. And then in number one spot for me in this round was Islands of Abandonment, Life in the Post-Human Landscape by Cal Flynn. This is a book of nature nonfiction, so it's no surprise. It's my favorite one of the bunch. I gave it 4.5 stars. Um, it wasn't perfect, but I thought uh, it was highly engaging. Um, it was written in an entertaining and informative style. Each section or each chapter um, talks about a different, a different location where... Um, Basically, humans have left this spot alone and nature has come back in its own way and become uh, a wild place again. Um, so there's islands that have been, uh, you know, all the humans have left the island and the island has gone back to its natural state or a, a natural state, a non-human state. Um, it talks about places that have been um, locations of human destruction like Chernobyl um, and what that landscape is like. Um, there's a dis lot of discussion in here. There's, I mean, there is a section in here that talks about um, the buffer zone in Cyprus, which I knew nothing, nothing about that, the history of that place. I didn't know that that event had ever occurred. Um, and so then to read about how this no man's land in between the the Turkish side of the island and the Cypri, the Cyprus you know, the the side that's still Cyprus, um, you know, the place in the middle and what that's like um, because it's been left to go wild. Uh, all just really, really interesting. I learned lots of new things. I thought this book, the tone of this book was wonderful in that it gives a sense of hope and wonder while acknowledging the realities that we are facing with climate change and human um, human impacts on the world. Uh, it talks about the resiliency of nature in the face of human interactions and human, um, you know, human development. And uh, it just gave really, really fascinating examples of how nature can reclaim its own and how, you know, it might not be the same as it was originally in an area that humans have left alone, but it still is a, it, they still are places that are wondrous and filled with biodiversity and um, are super, super important for the health of our planet. So I just thought this was really a wonderful book. I was very, very sad that it did not go through um, into the next round. Uh, so yeah, this one uh, did not go through and none of the nature nonfiction has gone through except for Under a White Sky by Elizabeth Colbert. Uh, Colbert. And I do love that book. So I'm really pleased that that one went through, but I'm very sad that uh, Islands of Abandonment has been left behind. Um, particularly because the book that I ranked number six <laughs> did go through. And the book that I ranked number five also went through. So yeah, I was certainly off kilter from the rest of the folks that were judging this particular group of nonfiction, which is fine. I mean, this everybody has their own likes and dislikes uh, when it comes to reading books. And that's just part of the fun of the project. Um, so yeah, I had a great time participating again. Again, like I said before, I don't think any of these books were bad books. It just happened to be the way that they fell out for me. Um, and I will be judging, uh, I 
think it's group B in the nonfiction category for the next round, the semifinals. Um, and I think I have three books that I have not yet read in that bunch. So be on the lookout in two months time for my reaction to those six books. And I hope that, um, I hope that there are certain books that are left in the group in the overall group of nonfiction that I really, really hope continue on to the final round of six. So we, we shall see. We shall see uh, whether or not I have any sense or idea of which books most readers on booktube like for nonfiction. Anyway, I hope you're all doing well and finding some good books to read and I will talk to you later.